We've been in this series on Acts. We're, we're flying through it, really. We're up to the middle of chapter two after like two months. <laughs> but um, uh, so far, uh, the risen Jesus appears to his disciples, tells them to go and wait until the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and then they're going to be witnesses near, far, and, uh, and they do, and they're sitting around, they're praying, and they're waiting, and they don't know what else to do, so they try and get organized, and they roll dice to pick the new disciple, and then he disappears from the Bible. <laughs> and, uh, and then the Holy Spirit comes, and the people are unleashed out into the streets, and they're praising, and sharing, and talking, and people are wondering what's going on. And then we come to the middle of chapter two. We, this is the very first uh, sermon ever preached in the uh, church. Um, I'm going to read from the message this morning. Uh, people's heads were spinning. They couldn't make head or tail out of any of it. They talked back and forth, confused what's going on here. Others said they're drunk on cheap wine. That's when Peter stood up and backed by the other 11, spoke out with bold urgency. All of you who are visiting Jerusalem, listen carefully and get this story straight. These people aren't drunk, as some of you suspect. They haven't had time to get drunk yet. It's only nine in the morning. That was the first sermon joke. You know, I think right there, the very first sermon, and they always had that thing of, you know, well, you ought to start out with a little joke. Okay. Got that out of the way. They're not drunk yet. Uh, and then he shares uh, the scripture that Jonathan just read to us from Joel chapter 2. In the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Sons will prophesy, your daughters, young men will see visions, old men will dream dreams. When the time comes, I'll pour out my spirit on those who serve, men and women both, they'll prophesy. Whoever calls out for help to me, God will save. Um, and he says, listen carefully to these words. Jesus, a man thoroughly accredited by God to you, the miracles and wonders and signs that God did through him are common knowledge. This Jesus following the deliberate and well thought out plan of God was betrayed by people who took the law into their own hands and was handed over to you and you pinned him on the cross and you killed him but God untied the death ropes and raised him up. Death was no match for him. And a little further down. Dear friends, let me be completely frank with you. Our ancestor David is dead and buried. His tomb's in plain sight today. But being also a prophet and knowing that God had solemnly sworn that a descendant of his would rule his kingdom, seeing far ahead, he talked to the resurrection of the Messiah. No trip to Hades, no stench of death. This Jesus God raised up. And every one of us here is a witness to it. And then towards the very end. All Israel didn't know this. There's no longer room for doubt. God made Jesus master and Messiah, this Jesus whom you killed on the cross. Cut to the quick. Those who are there listening ask Peter and the apostles, come on, what are we to do? Peter said, change your life. Turn to God and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so your sins are forgiven. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is targeted to you and your children and also those who are far away, whomever, in fact, God invites. He went on in this vein for a long time, urging them over to, because see the first sermon it went on and on also. <laughs> yeah. He went on and on, urging them over and over, get out while you can, get out of this sick and stupid culture. That day about 3,000 took him up, took him at his word, were baptized and signed up. They committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles, life together, common meals and prayers. And everyone around was in awe. So that was the very first sermon ever preached in the church. So Lord, teach us, teach us from this, teach us um, how we might trust you, how we might uh, be empowered by you, and how we might be your prophets in this world that we live. That's our prayer today, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, uh, I... Uh, <clears throat> Over the years of being a pastor, there have been a lot of currents uh, in uh, the idea of what goes on in church and in uh, uh, 
sermons and things like that. There was the time, in fact, you know, I was a hippie, you know, so there was a time where, you know, and sermons are out. That's it. We're going to sit around and we're going to look at each other's eyes and we're going to share. And, and, and that was cool, you know, for a while. And then people went, this is nothing but navel gazing. We're just sitting here being into, you know, we need to have a strong, and, and then so went through this thing and then people became really strong preaching and they wanted clear answers and they went, and then they went through a period of preaching. I'm doing the whole history of preaching here uh, from my lifetime. And uh, then they went through a time where Nobody's interested in the Bible. The Bible turns people off. Uh, there was one church that I won't mention uh, that was on television all the time, uh, the Crystal Cathedral. And they, uh, <laughs> I was, in a, I was on a, a mission board with uh, their pastor, and he said, I said, why don't you ever have a, a scripture reading in the worship service? Uh, and you never have a scripture related to your sermon. And he goes, well, people don't like it, and it doesn't go well on TV. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, so we don't have to worry about that. So, uh, but it, it, all of a sudden it was out, and, and everything had to be kind of uh, connecting and current things, and, uh, and that was nice. Uh, and then people went, but how's God going to speak into our life if we don't take his word seriously? So all of a sudden the wave turned the other way, and pretty soon... Uh, we're having verse by verse kind of expositions and things. Now, through all of this, I, I did about 10 years of teaching uh, homiletics at uh, Fuller Seminary uh, for their master's students and their doctoral students and their Korean doctoral students, which was very strange. And uh, <clears throat> talk about what preaching is. And I want to share this with you because it's really, really important. Homiletics means to say the same thing. That's what it means. It's not to come up with a new message. It's not to come up with some great new insight that nobody's ever heard before. It's not to build on what God started here in the Bible and now we're going to take it to another level. It's to say the same thing. So when you guys say to me, John, you've only got one message. I go, yeah. <laughs> Just say the same thing over and over again in, in a little different context. And, and when you think of it that way, you go, okay, then. Our messages today are basically no different than Peter's very first sermon back on that day of Pentecost. Isn't that interesting? The message has not changed. The message is that God is doing something in our lives and we need to stop and stop being so hooked into our culture and turn around and let the Holy Spirit work through our lives and take us in a whole new direction, which is back to Jesus. That's the, now you've heard the whole message for the next, however long I live, you know, so you don't need to take notes anymore. God is up to something. God is doing something. And if we would let him work in us and through us, amazing things can happen. It's no different than what Peter said here. Now, you ever heard that, the word prophet? Has any of the prophet doing prophecy usually the only time that I notice that uh, the word prophet or anything being talked about is right around January 1st you know the new year and like uh, uh, those uh, they're not newspapers really but those kind of weird things on the supermarket thing tabloids tabloids is that right <laughs> okay so they always have stuff about prophecy. I don't know if you notice that, but I mean, every year at New Year's, and, and they always have, you know, Nostradamus said that this is the year that bowling becomes popular. You know, it's like, whoa, this is gonna be it. And uh, it never is, you know, or the, uh, there's always some group that had a special calendar that's gonna really happen this year, you know. And, uh, and, they, and they usually have, there's always some, lady, some prophet lady with really high hair that's uh, being interviewed and she predicted something, you know, and so she'll tell you what's going to happen this year. Anyway, that happens all the time, right around, right around New Year's and, uh, and that has shaped people's minds about what prophecy is and it got us to think that maybe prophecy is uh, saying weird things about what's going to happen in the future, right? And so when it says the Holy Spirit will come by and, and you will... Uh, be prophets. 
We go, oh, I don't want to do that. Uh, that'd be weird, you know. Um, and so there's this fundamental misunderstanding of what it is to, to be a prophet. Because this scripture that Peter's referring to, and Joel is saying that when the Holy Spirit comes, everybody is going to be a prophet. Everybody is going to be a prophet. The young, the old, men, women, rich, poor, slaves, masters, everybody is going to speak prophecy. Well, we better, since that's your job, you ought to know what it is, right? And what is it? Very simple. It's just speaking God's word in the situation, into life. You're speaking God's word in it. Not a new message. You're saying the same message, but you're applying it into the relationships that you have, into the situations you have, into your work, and your neighborhood, into your family, and your friends. Whatever, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you're bringing God's word into it. That's what it means when the Holy Spirit unleashes us, and, and we all are out speaking God's word because, you know, frankly, if you came to me and said, you know, you know the future and you know what's going to happen, you know, long term, like in six months, I'd probably be skeptical. I don't even know what's going to happen six months ago. <laughs> you know, how are you going to get that far ahead? And, uh, uh, but you can speak God's word into life and into the lives of the people around you. That is a profound and powerful uh, ministry that you've been given. It's not just for the select few. It's for all of us. Um, so, Peter reads the scripture, says this is happening. And these people that you see out here sharing and praising and uh, expressing their celebration of the risen Lord Jesus, that's what you're hearing. They're speaking God's word out into the community. And, uh, and then he brings it back, because there's really, there's only one message, right? We say the same thing. He brings it all back to the risen Christ, to Jesus. The first sermon on Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit's unleashed, is not about the Holy Spirit. It's about Jesus. Because it always comes back to Jesus. And, and uh, how we, with our relationship with Christ, can have forgiveness and life and eternal life and a new way of living. So he, he presents this. And then... Um, an amazing thing happens. People go, what can we do? I, now I gotta tell you, as a, a preacher for a lot of years, that would be the coolest thing ever to, at the, at the end of the message, and he went on and on. I mean, you know, he, was, he couldn't land the plane, you know, he just kept circling. But, uh, but finally they went, what can we do? And that may be one of the greatest questions we could ever ask. Um, what can we do about this? What can we do about uh, God's word uh, being brought to us? What can we do about what, what, uh, what Jesus can do in our lives? What do we do about the Holy Spirit unleashing us and, and transforming our world around us? What can we do? And, and Peter says, what? You want to know what to do? Stop what you're doing, turn around, go another way, be baptized in the name of Jesus, and live for him in community. And evidently, some people took him up on it because it says like 3,000 people joined the church that day. Boy, that new members class was crazy. <laughs> What was the child care going to be like uh, immediately? Um, and the church was born in that. Now, what can we do? 
Yeah, I've been thinking about that uh, in my own life, my own situation, and I realized that I rarely get to that because I stop somewhere short of it. I go to, here's my question, what can I do? Given these circumstances, what might I consider doing? What would be possible for me to do? What am I able to do? See, aren't those all good things? Fabulous question, aren't they? They don't mean bip. It's a paraphrase of another Greek word. They don't mean anything because what we do is we say, you know, oh, you know, if I could, I would only do this. What will you do? Well, I could do this. No, no. Tell us what you're doing. See? A big difference between thinking conceptually about what we might do or couldn't do or able to do or get to do or call it, anything like that, and what we're actually doing. They could have said, you know, that's right. We should stop and turn around and repent and follow Jesus and be back. We should do that. You know what? I'm going to, you know, the rest of my days, I'm going to think about how I might possibly consider perhaps doing that. And then they leave town. That could have well been. That would have been, uh, you know, Presbyterian church, you know. <laughs> That's an old joke here. But um, it's what can we do? What are we going to do about this? Now, um, yeah, I've been doing a lot of research about different things, and, uh, and I've been caught in this tension of um, God giving us great dreams, big dreams and ideas of what can happen and what he wants to do in our lives and what he wants to do in our relationships and all these kinds of things, what he wants to do in our world. And we can have big ideas and big goals. But for some reason, I go to do that and then I stop. And, uh, and so I've been doing some uh, reading, and we probably talked about this before, but I... Um, I'm discovering the power of stupid little things. Incredible power in stupid little things. Now you have big dreams, but actually the steps that we take need to be pretty, pretty small, or else we're going to get blocked. You know? uh, I think I told you about the, the book I, I downloaded that I read that was... Um, the guy wanted to do an exercise program, but he couldn't ever go to the gym, he couldn't work out anything, so he finally made the goal, he would do one push-up a day. That's stupid small. That's really stupid small. But he said, I could do that. Okay. And while I'm down there, I might do two. I don't know. You know. But, so I thought, you know, what would happen if the, the things that, that Peter said to do are not overwhelmingly large things. They're kind of stupid small, aren't they? Stop what you're doing! Oh, okay. Step one. <laughs> Turn around! Okay. Step two. Now go a new direction with Jesus. Where are we going? I, no, don't worry about it. What are we going to do? Don't worry about it. This is stupid small. Take a step to follow Jesus. Now, if, if Peter would have said, you want to know what you can do? I want you to start meeting in small groups all over the city in public places, and I want you to be praising together and sharing. I want you to be studying God's word. I want you to get intimately involved in their lives. I want you to share totally vulnerably, and uh, you'll be doing all this, and then have big crowds around you that are going to watch and listen in while you're sharing your really private, individual, intimate things, and your greatest failures, and um, confessing your sins one to another, and the crowd gathers even bigger, and then uh, you invite them in, and then it's, it's going to grow geometrically. Okay? Go do it! Stupid small. Take a step to follow Jesus. Then it says all those other things happened. Right? Then they were 
studying and sharing and praying and caring and praising and reaching and, and people were in awe. They'd never seen anything like it. So then I started thinking, okay, so what is it that blocks us from just stopping, turning around, and taking a step to follow Jesus? Well, one is, we don't want to stop and turn around. That's one. But another one is, and I found this in the church yet, uh, some of you have been followers of Jesus for a long time, so Sometimes, what, what Jesus calls you to in this, this fellowship that they have, you know, this koinonia is the word that they use in, in Acts 2. They were committed to the teaching and to the fellowship, to the koinonia. To the, it's the, the sharing together, the coming together and sharing intimately and confession and encouragement and uh, prayer for each other, all those things. That's a little bit scary. Um, you don't mind if someone else wants to share, but better not to yourself, you know. And so, um, one of the things I've found over the years is that sometimes the longer we follow Jesus, the less connected we are in fellowship. The easier it is to have our devotional life or our you know, spiritual life over here, and that's kind of what we have. And don't really want to get connected with people because people, I don't know if you know about that, you know, almost all my problems have had to do with people. <laughs> I, I, I learned long ago, you know, if we had no people in the church, I'd be a fabulous pastor. You know, no criticism. Well, no, then I'd probably talk to myself, <laughs> you know. But um, the thing is, turning towards each other and needing each other and realizing that our ministry is, is among each other. That that's where the Holy Spirit uh, works in us, in this fellowship. And it's not as we pull away uh, and, uh, like I did the last three months, and withdraw um, for one reason or another. Because some things, when we start thinking that people are an interruption, then we don't see them as our ministry. If we see them as a bother, then how do we share intimately with them? They're bugging us, you know? I don't want to share with people who bug me. And I don't want to share with people who think I'm bugging them. Better we just stay separate and aloof. So uh, one year long ago, Eileen and I went to Ireland. It's the Holy Land for her because she was an Irish citizen. And so uh, we're in the Holy Land and uh, <laughs> south of Dublin, about an hour and a half. And we saw a sign on the road to go to this uh, monastery, uh, Glindalock Monastery. And uh, I thought, let's go see this. This is kind of cool, you know, old Irish, you know, thing. And so we went there, we walked around the grounds, very nice and everything. And, and, and then I started reading the history of it. And, and this is the weirdest thing. It was the, the place uh, where uh, a saint was, Saint Kevin, actually. <laughs> uh, it's a weird, weird name for a saint, but that was actually literally his name. And I thought, it's supposed to be like Saint Pius or something. But no, it's the same cover. And so, uh, and, and he was a real guy a few hundred years ago, a uh, monk there, and had this renown for his piety and his uh, commitment <laughs> that he was so committed uh, that he would climb up this sheer cliffs and, and there were caves, little caves way up in the cliffs. And he would go up there and be there for several days while he meditated and prayed and, uh, you know, spent time with the Lord, and then he would come down and he'd be, you know, very pious. And, and then they say that uh, there was this nun, a very beautiful nun, who was pious and devoted also, and, and, uh, and loved St. Kevin. And so, 
uh, when he was up in the cave, she would sometimes go up and take food to him. And she'd climb up the sheer face of the cliff and in the cave, and, and she would uh, bring him his lunch, I guess, you know. And, uh, and then one day, he was irritated because of her interruption. And so he strangled her and threw her body off the cliff to her death. I know. <laughs> I'm, reading, I'm reading this going, no kidding? <laughs> and we pulled off the highway for this? And they didn't see a problem that, because he was so pious. <laughs> and so it was all right to do that because she was interrupting with a tuna sandwich or whatever, you know? And, uh, and I thought, I thought of the church. Immediately, I don't know, you know, my mind just went to that. And I thought, how often is it that, that we find people who want to be caring and involved in life with us in, in this fellowship, in this koinonia, and we find them irritating? If they just leave us alone, right? and miss the point that that's why we're here. That's the whole reason. St. Kevin's piety wasn't for its own sake. It's for what God's going to do in us and through us together. That was a really bizarre story, okay? So let's <laughs> get that out of your head. Um, But then it comes down to what happens when the Holy Spirit is unleashed in your life, in your mind, in your relationships, in your situation. Because the risen Christ is with us now. The Holy Spirit is alive and well. The message is the same, and God's power is the same. But you ever get the feeling that, uh, you know, God kind of abandoned you? Or he, he left you for people that are more interesting? And I was thinking about in my own life, whenever I go through a, a particularly hard time, one of my first thoughts is, oh, I guess God's busy somewhere else. You know? <clears throat> um, and when, during a particularly difficult time, um, Eileen and I were, we kind of hung on by, we'd play music sometimes, and, and uh, a certain song would click for us. And there was one that, um, I don't know, I only know the words of one, one to the chorus of it. He didn't bring us this far just to leave us. He didn't teach us to swim to let us drown. He didn't build his home in us to move away. And he didn't lift us up to let us down. I think that's the same message that the people back in Acts needed to hear. It's the same message I need to hear. It's the message you need to hear from time to time, that God's not done with you. He's not finished, and he's brought you here for his purposes. And there's things he wants to do through you, and you now are his voice. His prophet, to speak into the lives of the people around you and wherever you go today, bring a word from the Lord. A word of encouragement, a word of hope, a word of love. Because I gotta tell you, we all need that. We all need it. We need to be reminded of it.
So that's enough for now. I'm not going to circle like like Peter. I mean, you know, we'll just end it there. You know. So, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would come through our hearts and minds and lives and relationships and work and cares and worries and um, frustrations and pains and all of those things and that you would have your way in us. And give us the courage to, to be your prophet, to speak your word with love and with care and with hope. And Lord, thank you that you don't leave us. You never leave us. You'll never forsake us. You didn't bring us this far just to leave us. We can trust in you. Thank you for the gift of koinonia, fellowship of the Holy Spirit, of which we've only maybe scratched the surface, but you keep drawing us back to it. So Lord, we love you. We ask that you be present this week, step by step by step. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.